Much to Donald Trump's dismay, jury selection in his New York hush money election interference trial is moving faster than many expected, with a judge overseeing the trial claiming that at this rate, opening statements could start as soon as Monday. And while Trump once again made this claim. I know more about courts than any human being on Earth. OK. Yeah, today he showed his ignorance, at least with the jury selection process, falsely believing he was supposed to be granted unlimited strikes against prospective jurors, which, if true, would theoretically mean he could forever delay the start of a trial by striking every potential juror. What Trump does know more about than any other human being is how to freak out, whine, and rage against the judicial system, the judge, and, of course, the prosecutor, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, who he says should be more focused on crime in the city. It's Alvin Bragg's fault. Yeah. Alvin Bragg does nothing. He goes after guys like Trump, who did nothing wrong. Violent criminals, murderers, they know there are, there are hundreds of murderers all over the city. They know who they are. They don't pick them up. They go after Trump. Okay, let's forget for the moment that major crime in the fact that major crime in New York City uh, has actually gone down this year. The incessant attacks on Bragg from Trump and those on the right have also been a way for them to expand their reach to attack other progressive prosecutors. He's one of maybe a dozen or more across the country that get elected on an ideological agenda, usually with funding from people like George Soros. They weaponize the, the, you know, the DA's office there as they have other Soros funded DA's offices around the country. Joining me now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney, professor at the University of Alabama Law School and MSNBC legal analyst, and Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change, who has backed progressive prosecutors, including Alvin Bragg. Thank you both for being here. I do want to go to you first, Rashad, because the day that Donald Trump's uh, jury selection began in his, in his trial, in his election interference trial, he floated this memo that named... George Soros, they're all Soros-funded, Soros-funded prosecutors, and named Color of Change in attacking Alvin Bragg. This has become a thing. Talk a little bit about this trend in attacking people by calling them Soros-funded and also naming Color of Change. Well, it's no surprise that the rich and powerful who now sometimes, every once in a while, are held accountable are going to then go attack the very people who are doing the work to hold them accountable. You know, we have worked uh, for years to um, make the criminal justice system more fair, to be able to level the field and to be able to bring safety and justice to all people, to all communities. And as part of that effort, we've gone out and we've raised money in that effort to engage in ele elections. But Joy, I want to demystify what we've used that money for. We've used that money to be able to expand the number of people who vote in these elections. District attorney elections are famously low turnout elections. Yes. In fact, we've been in a place where 90 percent of district attorneys have run unopposed. So we've worked to expand the number of people, particularly at Color of Change, the number of black people who vote in these elections, making our democracy actually work better for all people. And in that process, we've um, brought people together around uh, um, brunches and other events where we've had them contact voters. We've went out and knocked on doors. We've raised money to send mail and to communicate digitally, all in an effort to give people a deep understanding about what's at stake for these offices. In the process, electing district attorneys who will help uh, the little guy, who will stand up for the little guy who will help to make our systems more fair and to also hold those in power accountable, just like they hold everyone else accountable. And we're not quite there yet. Um, we still have a long way to go. And we also hold the people we put in office accountable. But Donald Trump, just like everything he does, wants to distract us from all of the ways in which he has used the system, used the levers of power, used the levers of government. Uh, for his own benefit. And so none of us should be distracted. And all of us should be, I think, invested in making sure any and every election um, has as many people turning out as possible. Right. I mean, Joyce, this is the thing is that the, you know, the job of district attorney, the job of attorney general, these are elected offices. And so the, the justice that's meted out in these communities to set aside the Donald Trumps who can delay and delay their trials for ordinary people. It really matters who the D.A. is, whether or not you're a black or brown person or a person of color or another person of color or a, a, a poor person, whether you can get justice. And I just want to list some of the, D, the D.A.s who've been attacked. Kim Fox, she's not seeking a third term. She's been the subject of these kinds of attacks in San Francisco. 
Francisco, Chesa Budin, who has made crime and homelessness an issue and trying to mitigate, you know, using the, the criminal justice system to deal with the homelessness problem. You've had in the Tampa Bay Times, you've got this story about DeSantis removing, he removed two different um, state attorneys, Andrew Warren, who refused to prosecute people based on uh, uh, um, the, the, the bans on abortion, and Monique Worrell, um, essentially, who also was trying to make the criminal justice system more fair to poor people and people of color. I, I mean, I, I, there is a trend, I would say, um, Joyce. I would, I would include Marilyn Mosby in Maryland, who, you know, got, people got very angry that she prosecuted police in the Freddie Gray case mm -hmm. and tried to mitigate the sentences of hundreds of people based on, uh, impro you know, improper actions by police. They are attacked based on that. Talk a little bit about this. Yes, so we hear the explicit appeals to racism and anti-Semitism in these attacks, but there's more to it than just that. As you're pointing out, district attorneys, state and county DAs are elected by the people and they're responsible to the people when they set their priorities for prosecution. And beyond that, many of these reformer DAs, these and others, represent a shift in criminal justice that says these old policies, these tough on crime policies have failed again and again. They've led to mass incarceration. They've stripped black communities of an entire generation of young men and young leaders. And they haven't reduced crime. Instead, we have overcrowded prisons. We incarcerate more people than most countries, and we incarcerate them for longer periods of time. So these new prosecutors were elected on smart on crime theories, thinking that we could do more, for instance, with pre-prosecution programs, with community-based programs that were data-based and shown to reduce crime. We see that to some extent in New York City, where crime, as you pointed out, is down. We see that in other communities. But again, the politics of prosecution is interfering with what's best for our communities when someone like Donald Trump appeals to these old, tired sorts of ideas as opposed to letting prosecutors do the job their communities are electing them to do. Yeah, amen. And I will note that the one person that has not been attacked by him is Aileen Cannon, who's been very favorable to him. But we begin tonight with the remarkable split screen this week from the two major parties' presidential candidates. On Tuesday, while Donald Trump was in a Manhattan courtroom for the second day of his criminal trial, President Biden was in his childhood hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, campaigning like a normal candidate laying out his tax plan that includes ending Trump's tax cut for billionaires and tax relief and economic boosts for regular Americans. During her stay in court, the presumptive Republican nominee spent his time looking agitated and getting admonished by the judge for intimidating a juror. Later in the day, he transitioned to campaigning, visiting a New York City bodega, which, you know, seems totally normal for a campaign, right? Oh, yeah, it was uh, one where years ago an employee killed a man. During an altercation, the bodega visit was organized by the New York Young Republicans Club, which you might remember as the group that hosted a gala featuring white nationalists in 2022, and whose leader, Gavin Wax, who was also at the bodega campaign stop, infamously told supporters at an event attended by Trump last, last December, and I quote, once President Trump is back in office, we won't be playing nice anymore. It will be a time for retribution. All those responsible for destroying our once great country will be held to account after baseless years of investigations and government lies and media lies against this man. To which Trump said, Gavin, that was an excellent speech. Today, we had another remarkable split, a remarkable split screen. President Biden was in Pittsburgh talking about the economy. Under my predecessor, who's busy right now, <laughs> Pennsylvania lost 275,000 jobs. I mean, let's, let's look at the facts. On my watch, unemployment hasn't been this low for this long in 50 years. And where's Trump? Well, he's using his one day off from court this week to have dinner tonight with the right-wing president of Poland, Andrzej Duda. Duda is a semi-autocrat who, much like Trump's favorite European autocrat, Hungary's Viktor Orban, has clamped down on the press and judiciary and feuded with the European Union. He also once proposed naming a Polish military base Fort Trump, prompting much mockery in Poland. But unlike Orban, Duda is a staunch supporter of Ukraine in its war with Russia. 
Last month, after being hosted by Trump at Mar-a-Lago, Orban crowed about how Trump would end the war in Ukraine by refusing to give them a penny if he's reelected. Donald Trump palling around with European strongmen in what little free time he has these days is a good reminder of what he's done to the Republican Party, making it pro-autocrat and pro-Putin. Even the issue at the heart of what Trump is on trial for now touches on this. I'm sure you remember this. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Well, turns out Russia was listening because we eventually learned that that was the day that they started hacking the Democratic and the Republican National Committees. And a couple of months later, on October 7th, the Obama administration formally accused Russia of interfering in the 2016 election by hacking into the emails of both the DNC and the RNC. And on that very same day, the Access Hollywood tape at the heart of Trump's hush money case was released, erasing news coverage of the Russian attack putting Republicans on the spot about how their nominee was a sex pest rather than how Russia was openly trying to reelect or trying to elect their pro-Putin, pro-Russia nominee. Because around the same time he was calling on Russia for Hillary Clinton's emails, his campaign was gutting language in the Republican Party platform, calling for the U.S. to provide lethal defensive weapons to the Ukrainian government, which at the time sparked outrage among Republican foreign policy hawks. And the Washington Post reported that as the Obama White House enlist, tried to enlist Congress to warn the public about the threat to election systems in the summer of 2016, Republicans resisted, arguing that to warn the public that the election was under attack would further Russia's aim of sapping confidence in the system. Senate Majority Leader at the time, Mitch McConnell, went further, officials said, voicing skepticism that the underlying intelligence truly supported the White House's claims. In fact, additional reporting from the Post found that McConnell made clear to the administration that he would consider any effort by the White House to challenge the Russians publicly an act of partisan politics. McConnell did eventually sign on to a bipartisan letter about election security that literally did not mention the word Russia. But eight years after conveniently dismissing the threat of Russia to get a pro-corporate tax cut Republican elected to president, who also would deliver Mitch's dream of a right-wing Supreme Court majority, McConnell is back to playing party of Reagan and pushing hard for U.S. aid to Ukraine. Others in the Republican Party, however, now fully enthralled to Trump, are still trying to protect Putin. The Republican chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, said his Republican colleagues are even spreading Russian propaganda on the House floor when discussing the Russia-Ukraine war. While two Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey of Georgia, are threatening to oust their latest speaker, Mike Johnson, if he poses a bill to provide supplemental aid to Ukraine. Joining me now is Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, who was a member of the House January 6th Select Committee. Congressman Raskin, it is truly stunning to watch this turnaround in Republicans from being the party of Reagan, who said, you know, who was very much standing up to the USSR, to essentially stumping for Russia on the House floor. How do you read it? Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, has been um, recycling direct Russian propaganda. She says that our tax dollars are going to support uh, U Ukrainian Nazis. And that is a, a Putin line that he's uh, denazifying uh, Ukraine and that it's a Nazi state. Of course, it is a liberal democracy committed to equal rights for everybody and human rights. And it has the only Jewish president uh, in the world outside of Israel. So calling it a Nazi state is such an affront and an insult um, to the Ukrainian people. And it's just a lie. And yet we're hearing a lot of that coming from various Republican members and different sources to the point where you're getting now Republican chairman finally of committees uh, like the Foreign Affairs Committee saying that Russian propaganda has invaded the ranks of the Republican Party. Let me play uh, what I, there are a lot of them, but this might be one of the most um, uh, embarrassing and uh, shameful moments in the Trump presidency. Let me play it. This was Trump in Helsinki in July 2018. All I can do is ask the question. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin 
Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. And that was on whether or not Russia was interfering in our election. And Congressman Raskin, at the time, that produced gasps, even among Republicans. How did we get to the point where Republicans went from finding that to be an outre and unacceptable comment, even, Russia, even Republicans thinking that, to essentially that being the bottom line? Putin is innocent. Ukraine is guilty. And essentially, effectively, I guess what Mike Johnson's caucus is saying is that the United States must back off and allow Putin to take over Ukraine. Well, Donald Trump has cemented his alliance with Vladimir Putin uh, and Putin's filthy imperialist invasion of Ukraine and attack on Ukrainian democracy. Um, it is splitting the Republican Party right now because um, some of the I don't know what to call them, the more conservative institutionalists who at least maintain some memory of an earlier Republican Party are not willing to throw themselves completely into the putin she autocrats camp. Uh, but, of course, then you've got the, the Matt Gates and the Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Chip Roy, the hardcore MAGA faction, which will follow Donald Trump in that direction. We'll see this week whether or not uh, the Democrats are going to be able to uh, convince Mike Johnson to hold out and to put Ukraine funding on the floor, because uh, this is the central battlefield between democracy and freedom on one side and tyranny and autocratic corruption on the other. So we just want a clean up or down vote. We know we've got a majority in the House that will support $61 billion for our besieged Ukrainian allies. But it is a desperate situation over there right now. And, I, you know, I don't know whether or not uh, Trump's uh, obsession with Putin is psychological or emotional or economic or financial or political or ideological. It doesn't really make any difference anymore. It's very clear that he stands on the side of, of Vladimir Putin. And so the struggle between democracy and autocracy is not just between our country and other countries. It is happening within America right now, and it's happening on the floor of the U.S. Congress. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.